Uh, can you hear me now? The old AT&T commercial. Can you hear me now? He writes, uh, I find that when I am asking God to forgive me, I am often in reality, unless I watch myself very carefully, asking him to do something quite different. I'm asking him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us two will be exactly as it was before. But the trouble is that when we call asking God's forgiveness, very often really consist in asking God to accept our excuses. Speaking on the topic of what forgiveness really looks like, it's Brother Michael McCorkle. Brother Michael and wife Carrie live in North Texas and worship at the congregation in Denton, Texas. Michael and Carrie are blessed with children Jordan and David Richburg, Jesse and Dustin Gaskins, Jerrica and Trevor Lowry, and Jacob. They are proud grandparents to Adeline and Oliver. Michael is involved with the work in Nigeria and will be traveling there later this year. In addition to preaching, he is a Bible teacher at a private Christian school in Frisco, Texas. Brother Michael McCorkle speaks on what does forgiveness look like. Well, good morning. I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, I have, I've appreciated Brother Mark's comments and him quoting C.S. Lewis. I love the things that I've read of C.S. Lewis's. I appreciated Ian. He's kind of a poor man, C.S. Lewis, isn't he? For those of us who can't read C.S. Lewis. Lee, I thought, did an excellent job, although I will say... He, when he said, nobody gets up this morning and says, I'm going to be the child of the devil today, that's a little young naivety, isn't it? <laughs> Some people do wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be the child of the devil today. I want to talk to you about what forgiveness looks like. And those of you who've heard me speak, you know I like to use pictures in my PowerPoint because I believe they convey emotion, they convey bigger ideas than sometimes I can. Don't want to. Maybe for you it looks like this. That guy is climbing. An uncomfortable wall looks like to me. You know, sometimes forgiveness is a really big thing. And I want to be just as transparent and like you as I can be today. It doesn't look like either one of these to me. Forgiveness, you know what forgiveness looks like to me? That's what forgiveness looks like to me. I told Lee I was glad he did the crying so I wouldn't have to. <laughs> April the 10th, many of you know, my son was hit by a drunk driver. That was hard. She was a young lady in her 30s, been at the casino partying, driving home on I-35. She was driving south on the northbound side because she was so drunk, she took an exit ramp as an entrance ramp. Carrie and I were out of town. I got up that morning, woke up that morning that this had occurred. This happened in the night. And we've got the trackers on the phone. And do you ever just have a feeling that something's not right? And I thought, I need to check on Jacob. And I got out my phone and I looked. And it showed he was in Gainesville, Texas. Now he's supposed to be in Lindsay, Oklahoma, or Goldsby, Oklahoma, at my parents' house. And I thought, man, that's odd. What's his phone doing in Gainesville, Texas? 
And I thought, well, you know, maybe he had to go to work and he got called back because sometimes he'd have to work on a Saturday. Maybe he had to go back to work. And about that time, I saw on my phone that we have one of those ring doorbells. And I saw that it had gone off just an hour or so before that. And so I looked, I thought, well, that was Jacob getting home and the phone just hadn't updated. And I looked to see him coming in and I pulled it up and it showed me a little video and it was a police officer at my front door. And I knew, I knew right then. And about that moment, I got a phone call from that police officer and he said, is this Mr. McCorkle? And I said, yes, sir. He said, do you have a son named Jacob McCorkle? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I regret to inform you that he was hit by a drunk driver last night. He's still alive, but that's all I know. That's all I can tell you. He said he's at a hospital in Denton and I have their phone number. And my life changed just like that. We talk about forgiveness. I'd preached about forgiveness for years. But we talk about it almost in a laboratory kind of way, you know. I want you to understand that forgiveness, this is something that for me changed because I've had to live it inch by inch this last year. And I want you things that I've learned from the Bible. My eyes have been open to, to many things. With you just briefly about what forgiveness is not. There's a lot of this has already been covered, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to understand that it any revenge that's not forgiveness. Period. If you do anything to see that they get theirs, it's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is a release from the penalty. That's what forgiveness is. I release you from the penalty of what you did. I release you, but I'm going to get you a little first. But then I'm that's not forgiveness. God said this, do not repay evil for evil. Sometimes you want to. Sometimes you want people to suffer for what they've done. So they'll understand how bad they hurt other people. So they won't do it again. All noble sounding motives. But I'm going to tell you, forgiveness is not ever mixed with vengeance. Ever. Another thing that forgiveness is not is forgiveness is not undoing. Now I know we flew here yesterday Dustin and the kids, and we're in the airport, and uh, Oliver has got something he's eating, and he drops it on the floor in the airport, and didn't bother him at all. <laughs> he just do what's done. He could eat that, and it didn't make him sick as far as we can tell yet, but is whatever germs thing when he mouth. Forgiveness does not undo what was done. Tender, no matter how bad they feel, no matter how difficult it is, they can't undo what they did. You can't. Now, if I cheat you a hundred bucks, I can pay you later if I repent. I can pay. But I can't undo the cheat. I'm going to tell you something. There's some stuff that there's nothing you can begin to do to undo. Abuse, infidelity, 
drunk driving and almost killing someone? You can't begin to undo that. We got a problem, Max? Cut this one off. Okay, time out. Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen men in black, but they've got this little stick and they can go beep, and everybody's memory just goes away in the last few minutes. Boy, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to have something like that? But the truth of the matter is, you don't have to have one of those to forgive. I know we hear a lot of talk about forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. I'm going to tell you something. I will never forget April the 10th. I'll never forget that. Doesn't mean I can't forgive it. But I'll never... We serve an omniscient God. He knows everything. Do you think He really... Oh yeah, I forgot they did that. <laughs> no, He doesn't forget you did that. And He refuses to remember it against you when He forgives you. But He doesn't forget the thing happened. You don't have to be able to go, oh, I didn't remember it happened in order to forgive. Another thing forgiveness is not is it is not the removal of all consequences. When you forgive someone, that doesn't mean that all the consequences of their actions are removed. Okay? You cannot hold something against someone and they can still suffer for what they've done. If it's a crime... They may go to prison for it. They may serve time in jail for it. If it's a infidelity, their marriage may be over. It may be done. If it's abuse, there may be people that will never forgive them, that they'll never have an opportunity to have a relationship with. The fact that you forgive someone does not mean that they won't suffer any consequences for what they've done. Sometimes we let that stop us. We think, well, if I forgive them, they'll just get away with it. Oh, no, they don't. They don't just get away with it if we forgive them. It's not the removal of consequences, but probably the biggest hindrance to forgiveness, the biggest misunderstanding about forgiveness that causes us not to forgive is we think forgiveness has to look like that. We think forgiveness means I just give you a big old hug and I say, I just love you so much. I, I feel so good about what you did. And I can't do that. Can you? I mean, when you've really, really been hurt, you've really been wronged, do you have to do that? Is that what forgiveness is? It's already been mentioned. The truth of the matter is, what you did is not okay. It's sin. It hurt me. And it hurt people I love. And it's never, ever going to be okay that you did that. And I'm never going to be okay that that happened. It was wrong. Forgiveness does not mean that I've decided your sin was not wrong. And I think that stops a lot of people from forgiving. Because they go, I can't do that. There's no way I can do that. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, I know God tells me to. But I can't. And I'm going to tell you, that's a misunderstanding of forgiveness. And it's a fundamental misunderstanding that hopefully we can correct here today. Forgiveness is not getting even or undoing the wrong. It's not forgetting it happened or removing all consequences. And it is certainly not feeling good about it. So what does forgiveness look like? I mean, when you look in the Bible and He talks about forgiving, what does it look like? Here's what it looks like. Be kind to one another. 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You be kind and tender-hearted, and you forgive just like God forgave. Now, look at our diagram here. You got the center down here, and then you got you, and then we got God up here. And when there is that sin that happens, when someone does something sinful or wrong to you, they hurt you, they wrong you, they cheat you, they abuse you in some way, their wrong is not just against you, but primarily their wrong is against God. It's sin. King David, we heard an excellent explanation of David and Saul's relationship. You know, David was not as pure as the driven snow. David had a guy killed so he could take the wife of that guy that he'd been committing adultery with. That's pretty sorry in my books. Do you know what David said when he repented? He said, against you, you only have I sinned. Really? What about Uriah? <laughs> I mean, doesn't he count? I would think David sinned against Uriah, right? What about Uriah's parents? Do you think David, in their eyes, had only sinned against God? You think they felt like David sinned against somebody? Yeah. What David is saying here is that the fundamental, primary problem with sin is it's against God. It's always against God. And God has wrath against that sinner for what he did. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's the wrath of God. Sin is no light thing. I think one of the reasons that we have so many problems in our culture today, and in, in the churches today, is we don't understand how evil sin is. Sin is horrible. God hate, God despises sin. And God will deal with sin. The wrath of God is against every sin. Okay? But that's not the only place there's wrath. There's also wrath from me against that person. Right? Because even though David says, I only sinned against you, I feel like he sinned against me too. I feel like what he did was wrong. To, it was, wasn't it? In fact, the Bible acknowledges that in Matthew chapter 15. If a brother sins against you, they've sinned against me. So not only do we have the wrath of God coming down on this guy or gal for what they did, we got the wrath of me. I'm going to tell you something. We think God's wrath is bad, but boy, look out for my wrath. Right? You ever feel that way? Maybe not exactly that way, but you know what I'm talking about. So what did this passage teach us? God forgives us. He says, you be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God... What's it say? for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. You know what the Bible teaches about why God forgives that guy? For Christ's sake. God looks at that person and God says, somebody's got to pay for that. Because we all you've got that sense of justice in your head, don't you? Somebody does something wrong, like gets in your way on the highway. Somebody's got to pay for that or something real serious, God's got a sense of justice. He says, somebody's got to pay for that. And God, in His mercy, answers through the voice of Jesus Christ, I'll pay for it. And Jesus Christ pays for the sin and the wrath of God then is poured out on Jesus Christ at the cross for the sin of this sinner. And God looks at that and He goes, somebody's got to pay for that. And Jesus said, I will. And God says, okay. It's been paid for. You're forgiven. The debt is gone. Well, that's great. 
except we still got some wrath over here to deal with. Right? What about this wrath over here? When I look at this person, I go, well, I'm going to tell you something. What they did, Jesus may have paid for that with God, but I'm going to tell you it wasn't good enough for me. Really? You know, Jesus died for vertical sin, but He also died for horizontal sin. And if I, how dare I look at Jesus and go, listen, your death may have been good enough for God, but it wasn't good enough for me to forgive these people. Lee talked about telling God to get off the throne of judgment and let me sit down. That's pretty shameful, brothers and sisters. And he says, you forgive for the very same reason God forgave. You see, Jesus Christ actually paid for sin. You say, you don't know what she did to me. She ought to be put in prison. She ought to be arrested. Jesus was arrested. Well, He ought to be beat within an inch of His life. Jesus was beat within an inch of His life. I'm going to tell you what they did to me. They ought to be crucified. Yeah, they should be. And Jesus was. Jesus paid for sin. He paid for it. Every little bit of it. And when I look at you and I say, I won't forgive you, I am saying to God, the death of your son may have been good enough for you, but it wasn't good enough for me. And if that's true... If the death of Jesus really isn't good enough to forgive your sin, how can I be sure it's good enough to forgive my sin? I got a problem. Scripture says this, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's the way God described His forgiveness to you and me. Okay? Now looking at that as a pattern, what is that? I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. And when I look at them, I just go, I know they did wrong, but my goodness, they're just so cute. <laughs> they're just so, man, I just can't stand it. I just, it's like Oliver did something. I'm going, all right, boy. You know, but... No. God doesn't look at you and go, man, I know they messed up, but I just, they're just so cute. I got to, I got that's not, that's not forgiveness. You know what this is? This is a promise that I won't remember this against you. There's a promise of forgiveness. And what forgiveness really looks like, it doesn't look like hugging them and going, yes, it's okay what you did. What it looks like is, here's a promise I'm going to make to you, and I'm going to keep that promise, and it's the promise of forgiveness. And that promise of forgiveness has two aspects to it. Number one, there is a point in time when you make that promise. Lee talked about saying, well, I'll just move away and I won't ever see him anymore. I'll just stay away. From... That doesn't fix it. You know that doesn't fix it. Just avoiding them doesn't fix it. What fixes it is, pr is forgiveness. And there is a point in time when you think about what they did and you decide, you know what? I'm not going to hold that against them anymore. That's the point of forgiveness. But you know, forgiveness is not just a point. Forgiveness is also a process. A lot of times people say, well, I just need some time. Just give me some time. What they're talking about is the process. And I'm going to tell you something. You can make the promise and the process is still hard. You can make the promise and the process may take the rest of your life. But you can do that. Because you see, when you make the promise at the point, that's step one. The rest of it is keeping the promise. 
Now, we all know people who will make promises they don't keep, don't we? You've dealt with them, right? People, oh, yeah, I promise you I'll do this, and, and it, you know it ain't ever going to happen. You've got to make the promise, but you also have to keep the promise. Now, let's look at this promise. The promises of forgiveness. God said, I will remember their sins and their iniquities against them no more forever, right? Okay? So what is that promise involving? It involves this. Number one, I won't bring it up to you anymore. I will not keep bringing it up. I will not say to you, listen, of course I have to look through your phone. I don't trust you. Do you remember what you did? I forgave you, but how do you expect me to trust somebody who will do what you did? You don't keep bringing it up. In a lot, counseling, a lot of times I see this with married couples. They do what I call gunny sacking. They just grab all this stuff and stick it down in the bag, and then you have the big fight, and we whip out the bag and dump it on the table. Look at all this stuff you've been doing to me. Oh, I forgave you. <laughs> but I just want you to remember you did this. Don't forget you did that. That's not forgiveness. That's not the way God forgives. That's not the promise. Listen, I've been on both sides of this thing. I've been the one who needs to forgive. I've also been the one who needed forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you something. God's forgiven me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen? God's forgiven me. And God does not keep reminding me of the sin that I committed every night. When I go to say prayer and I humble myself before God and I talk to Him about the sins of the day, He doesn't say, okay, I forgave you, but don't forget when you were in college, <laughs> I hadn't, I'm watching you now. It's not what God says. God doesn't bring it up to me anymore. You don't either. You make that promise to someone, don't bring it up again. Don't ever bring it up against them. Now, I'm not saying that you can never mention the incident. I'm saying don't bring it up against them. Number two, I won't bring it up to other people. I will not talk to other people about what a sorry no good you are. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tell people, listen... I forgave them, but you better watch them. You better look out. You better be careful. Listen, I'll, I will tell you that I'm struggling, and I just, as was mentioned, I just need a little advice here on how I can, as a ruse, to tell you what a no good they are. Don't do that. Forgiveness, the promise is, I'm going to not hold it against you anymore. I'm not going to bring it up to you. And I'm not going to tell other people about your mistake, your sin. Not just a mistake, but sin. And number three, and this is the hardest one, is I won't stew on it in my own mind. Talked to a person one time about forgiveness. It was obvious this person was bitter. And the lack of forgiveness in the Bible is called bitterness. Okay? And this person was obviously bitter, and I said, has anyone ever really hurt you? And they said, oh, yes. Yes, I've been hurt terribly. And I began to talk to this person about forgiveness. Mistake, Ian. I began to mention how God says we need to forgive. And they interrupted me and said, oh, no, 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 I forgave them. But I think about it every day. Now, we can sit here and laugh about that. But really, the promise of forgiveness is I'm not going to stew on it in my own mind. You might say, you don't know what they did to me. You don't understand. If you understood, you'd know why I think about that all the time. You'd know why that has become the life-defining moment of my existence. No, I don't know what they did to you. And I do know when you've been hurt really, really badly, you may have to push it out of your mind 60 times in 60 seconds. But you can do that. And if you will do that, it won't be long until you only have to push it out 59 times in 60 seconds. 
And if you'll keep doing that, eventually you'll only have to push it out once or twice every 60 seconds. And it can lead to the fact that you don't sit and stew on it in your own mind. You know, the Bible is full of teaching about how we use our minds. My mind is a part of my body just like my hands are. And if I use my, I've got this hand right here, I can use that to help you or I can use that to hurt you. If I wad it up in a fist and poke you in the nose, God holds me accountable for how I use that fist, right? God also holds me accountable for how I use that brain and the things I think. And He holds you accountable for that. You can choose to think about what you want to think about. My dad, when I was a young man, gave me moral advice and he said, Michael, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Does that make sense to y'all? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? You'll have thoughts. You can't control the thoughts that are going to come into your head, but you don't have to keep them there. You don't have to stew on them. You don't have to live in that world. You can push them out. So how do you do this? How do you keep that promise? Well, I've got four things I want to mention to you. Some have already been mentioned. Number one, you need to pray for them. Pray for the person who hurt you. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. Pray for them. Have you done it? Be honest. Have you got on your knees by your bed and said, God, please bless this person. Please help them. Please forgive them. Please see to it, Father, that there are people in their lives, unlike me, who are able to help them come to the repentance they need so they can be forgiven and go to heaven. Please, Father, do that for them. Are you willing to do that? You say, oh, I just can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you don't, it's just because you won't. And I say, well, I'd just be being a hypocrite. I'd just be being a hypocrite because I don't really feel that way about them. Listen, it is never hypocrisy to obey God regardless of how you feel. It's always right to obey God. You think while Jesus was being taken to the cross, He had warm fuzzies for those guys beating Him? No. But He loved them. And He prayed for them. You can do that regardless of how you feel. You need to pray for the people who have wronged you. You know why? One, God tells us to. Two, it's going to work on your heart. I'm going to tell you something. It is hard to pray honestly to God, please bless these people, and not go, okay, what do you want me to do? Well, that's hard to do. You've got an honest heart. Because you'll know that you're an avenue that God's going to use to bless that person. It's hard. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Don't get angry about it. Anger is, I mean, it can be a useful emotion. It's just an emotion, but the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It just doesn't. Number two, you need to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I'll forgive them, but I'm going to tell you something. Before I do, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I am going to let them... They need to understand exactly how bad they hurt us. They need to know what they've done to me or done to my family. And I'm going to let them know. You know what the Bible says about that in Proverbs? He says, a fool utters all his mind, but a wise man keeps it until afterward. Now I know you go to a counselor and they'll tell you, oh, you need to go vent you need to go stand over their grave and curse them and spit on the grave and, and that way you'll... No, you do not. That's bad advice. Don't do it. What you need to do is bless and not curse. You know what bless means? 
It means to speak good to and about them. That's what it means. You say good things about them to other people. I'd rather just keep my mouth shut and not say anything at all. You say good stuff to them when you're talking to them. I just have to bite my tongue. God says, no, you don't. You can say good things about them and you can say good things to them. You pray for them and then you say good to them and about them. Number three, be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. You have got to be tender-hearted. Now that's the mercy piece that we've been talking about. You've got to have mercy, right? Years ago when my oldest daughter was, was really young, she was about Oliver's age, I think, we'd taken her to get a photo. And uh, she was all dolled up, you know, and dressed up. And we were there at, I think, J.C. Penney's or wherever it was, we were getting the picture. And we had to wait out in the lobby. And that's not good if you got a little kid because they're going to get messy and all. But we were doing that. And they had a box of toys and Jordan would pick the toys out and she would take them and she would throw them into the box, these little plastic toys. Well, after a few minutes, this other lady and her daughter came in. And this daughter, she was huge. I mean, she was probably five, but compared to Jordan, she was huge. And what should have happened is I should have said, Jordan, take some toys over to that little girl. I didn't think about that. Jordan has her toys and she'd throw a toy in the box and that little girl came over and got it out of the box. Well, that's okay. Jordan throws another toy and the little girl comes and gets it. Jordan throws another toy and the girl comes and gets it. After a little while, Jordan was down to one toy. And she looked at that other little girl and she looked at her toy and she looked at the box and she knows what's going to happen if she throws the toy in the box. And the little girl stood watching her and finally, after a couple of minutes or a few seconds, comes running over, grabs the toy out of Jordan's hand and runs back over by her mama. Jordan turns, crying, running to daddy. At that moment, in my heart, I had tenderness toward my daughter. Now what I thought about that other little girl and her mama <laughs> at that moment was not tenderness. You understand the difference, don't you? My wife's family has phrases that they use that were unfamiliar to me when I married into the family. One of their phrases is nice nasty. You know what nice nasty is? Well, the building is small and I can't completely avoid them. So, how are you today? Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I've got to speak to you, but I sure don't like it. Nice nasty. Tenderhearted is the opposite of nice nasty. Tenderhearted is understanding that you have needed forgiveness just as bad as they do. You need that. You're never going to get past it if you're not tenderhearted. You know, one of the things I learned about a crisis like we went through with Jacob is that in a time like that, people either run to God or they run away from God. One of the two happens. And if you don't make your heart tender, you'll run away from God. Your heart will get harder and harder and harder. Four, Think on the positive. Focus on the positive. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about the good. You know, you say, I don't know how anything good can come out of this. I mean, this is all bad. It's destroyed a home or it's destroyed a life or it's, it's bad. There's good. About two months after the accident... We were at home. Jacob was still in a wheelchair. And at night, to get him to bed was quite a routine. And he still hurt a lot. He was on pain medication and he had to use a board to get from his wheelchair into his bed. And it was about an hour, hour and a half long process to get him to bed at night. And we were sitting there one night and Carrie was a little weepy about this. And Jacob looked at her and he said, What's wrong, Ma? She said, I just feel bad. 
that you're hurting. And he looked at her and he said, you don't wish this didn't happen, do you? And she said, yeah, I do. I really wish this didn't happen. And I said, why'd you say that, Jacob? And he said, he said, oh, I would never change this. I said, what? He said, listen. He said, I've always believed in God. All of my life I've believed in God. But now I know. And he said, I'd never change it. There's good. I'm telling you, there's good in every bad. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God who brings wonderful good things out of terrible evil things. He's done that in our lives. And He'll do that in your life. Ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then start looking for what are the good things that can come from that worst thing happening. And I guarantee you, if you're honest, you can think of good stuff that can come out of the worst thing happening. Well, what about justice? It's just not fair if they get away with it. It's just not right if they get to walk and we have to suffer the consequences. That's just not fair and it's not right. I'm telling you, that's a real feeling. It's an actual real feeling. In January, the woman who hit Jacob went to court, finally. And it was just a pre-court hearing, pre-trial hearing. And I talked to the DA... And the DA told me, she said, we have decided to offer a plea bargain to this person. I'm asked all the time, whatever happened to the person that hit Jacob? This is it. The plea bargain. Ten years probation. Ten years of probation. Plus a fine. Plus potential jail time of some length up to six months. And she said, that has yet to be negotiated. We're going to start at six months and her attorney's going to start at zero. And somewhere in between, we'll find a balance. Is that fair? Is that just? You know what the truth is? The truth is, I don't know what justice is in this situation. I don't know. I mean, she's a young 30s woman with a, a single mom with a four or five year old child. Is it justice to take her away from that child for 10 years? To put her in prison? Is that just? Is that really what should be done? I don't know. The kid might be better off without her raising him. I don't know. I don't know what's just. I don't know what's right. Did she repent? I don't know. She's never answered, or I say answered, she's never responded to us in any way. We've never heard from her. Why? Well, I'm sure her attorney has told her you don't contact him. The last thing he wants is for her to call and apologize to us and us get on the stand and go, yes, yeah, she admitted she did it. Has she repented? I don't know. Is she sorry? I don't know, she may not even be sorry, or she may be broken inside. I told Jacob, she's hurt you, but she's destroyed her life. What's justice? The problem is, I can't know. And so for me to go and crusade, well, she needs this, I don't know what's right. But God does. God knows what's right. And let's just suppose that they get zero jail time and she never pays the fine and she doesn't go to see her parole officer and he's too busy so he never turns it in. And next week she's out getting drunk and driving again. Did she get away with it? No, she didn't get away with it. You see, we serve a God who is the great balancer. 
He is the great justice. And this God will make vengeance His business if she walks. Avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I don't have to worry that she's not going to have to pay. That's not my job. That's not my place. My place is to not hold it against her personally. That's my place. Jesus said this, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. That's my job. And I'll tell you what the Bible has to say when you open it. It's not talking to anybody but you. It's not talking about what they did and how somebody else acted and what someone else needs to do. It's just talking to you. And when I read these words, it's talking to me. Well, what if they won't repent? I don't know. She repents or not. It's not my business. Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You think those people at the foot of the cross were repenting for hanging Jesus up there? Well, maybe they did. I don't know. What about this one? Lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen said that while they were throwing rocks at him to kill him. I'll tell you, a lot of people don't forgive because they excuse it by going, well, God doesn't forgive people that don't repent. I don't have to either. That's what Ian talked about. That's judicial forgiveness. You don't have a right to withhold judicial. You can't. That's God's business. Your business is to love them, pray for them, don't speak evil against them. Your job is to forgive them. So there's the threefold promise. You can do that. I don't care what anyone has done to you. You can do that. You can, can't you? You can make that promise. You can never bring it up again. You can never talk to other people about it anymore. You cannot stew on it in your own mind. They're hard, yes, but they're doable. You pray for them, bless them, be tender-hearted, and focus on the good. You can forgive. And I want to close with one story that happened in the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus fed 5,000. You remember the story where He had the feeding of the 5,000? And the apostles had seen Him do crazy things. I mean, stop storms and, you know, heal people of disease. They'd seen amazing stuff. And Jesus is here and they got thousands of people out there and Jesus goes, hey, these people are hungry. We need to feed them. And Nathaniel's going, oh, Lord, we don't have, there's no way we can do that. We don't have enough. Send them away. And Jesus said, no, have them all sit down. We have any food. Little boy had five loaves and two fishes. And these are a little boy's lunch. He wasn't carrying big wonder bread loaves. He, I mean, they were hard rolls and two little fishes. And he says, have everybody sit down. They all sit down. And he says, now line up here, boys. I want you to assume for a moment you're one of the apostles, okay? You're Peter or Nathaniel or somebody, and you're standing here, and you're all lined up here looking at all these people, and you go, okay, what are we going to do now? And the Lord comes by, and He tears off a piece of that bread, and He puts it in your hand, and you stand here holding your little piece of bread. And He goes, gives everybody bread, and then He, all the apostles... And then he comes and he gets a little piece of fish and he puts that on your hand. And he does the same. And you're thinking, okay, it's going to be a neat story, neat show. What's he going to say? And he says, now go feed them. What do you mean go feed them? Okay, make your point, Lord. Go feed them. Okay, he's the Lord. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to get me a crumb and I'm going to dab me a little fish juice on it and I'm going to give it to the first person. Then I'm going to do that to the second person and I'm going to do that to the third person. And I start handing out bread. And when I get to row five or six or seven, I start to realize I hold a piece of eternal bread in my hand. I come back and give Ian something to eat. <laughs> 
And I, we feed thousands. We could have fed millions because I'm holding in my hand a piece of eternal bread and a piece of eternal fish. By the time I get ten rows back, I've given away more than I could carry. And let's just suppose Andrew said, I am not going out in that bunch of people, hungry people with this little piece of bread. I'm standing here. And you went and you fed all these people. And you walk back and you hold out your hand and he holds out his. Who has the most bread in their hand? We well, both do. you got the same amount. But you've given away enough to feed millions. Now, hopefully you've made the analogy connection. God tells you, go forgive them. And you go, I can't do it, God. I've got this little piece of love and this little piece of forgiveness in my hand and it is not nearly enough to forgive what they did to me. God said, go forgive them. I can't, I can't. You can do that stuff, God, but I can't. I'm not you. I'm not the Almighty. I don't have enough. He said, go forgive them. And if you will, you will find that the love of God has been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to you. And you will give away more love and forgiveness than you could ever imagine because you trusted God. You committed yourself to Him. You hold His love in your heart. You hold the eternal love of God in your heart. You can forgive anything. You can forgive. And my message to you is make that promise. Whatever cupboard you have this sinner in back at the house, you need to make that promise. You can do it right now today. Talk to God. Make that promise and forgive them no matter what they did. Just make the promise and start keeping it. And I promise you, from God's Word, you will be rewarded. You will have the eternal love of God in your heart and you can forgive anyone for anything. Thank you for your concern, your care about this. And at this time, I'll turn it over to whoever's next.